you made today? Hmm. Waking up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's not really a decision for me to wake up necessarily. It's a decision just to get out of bed. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> What's the most important decision you made today? Not to be grouchy. Not to be grouchy. All right. <laughs> That's, I mean, you really sometimes we have to decide not to be the way we feel, don't we? Anybody else in my family? Decide you weren't going to join in, huh? The decide whether I was going to buy a new type of battery or keep, you know, powering me over there. <laughs> keep jump starting, huh? Uh, yeah. And we've been going through that at our house, too. It's going to be a new one. I'm not going to bother you. Anybody else? What's the most important decision you made today? To agree with my daughter-in-law <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, that's my son, that it is time the girls went to preschool. Uh -huh. um, so she and I went to daycare extra when we got home. Nick will just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Way to go, Grandma. <laughs> Way to take charge. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? The most important decision you made today? See, I think. For me, every day when I get up, I need to have an open mind to how the day's going to go because I cannot make it the way I think it's going to be. I wake up every morning saying, let it be what it will be. And that's my main decision because with the three children, sometimes what I plan is not going to work the way that I have to. Be okay with it. Sometimes you just have to be willing to grow, grow with the flow. Yeah, have an open mind. Go with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's my decision every day because of our lifestyle and the children. Well, now, so if those were the most important decisions you made today, what was the least important decision you made today? What you had for breakfast? Yep. Two pizza tonight, which I'm thinking already I'm going to need a tons for some heartburn probably after a while. That'll be the next decision I make after class. What do I take for that heartburn? What else? What's the least important decision you made today? Color socks I put on. What color socks you put on? Okay. You're getting pretty. Some people might argue that that's very important. Some people might go toe to toe with you that's an important decision, especially my husband, which can never determine black and blue. And then when you tell him which one is black and which one is blue, he will stand and argue with you for five minutes. I'm like, why do you ask me if you're going to argue about it? You know, you know, why are you asking? Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Anybody else? The least important decision you made today? I think just eating because it just comes naturally. Yeah. Well, tonight, obviously, we're going to be talking about choices and decisions. And we call that, the big fancy word for, for it is our volitional life, our life of choice. God gave us free will, right? He allows us to choose every day and make the decisions for ourselves every day, right? So with that in mind, I want us to start... Um, with our scripture, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Numbers 22, verses 1 through 35. And while you're looking at it, everybody turn around and tell Debbie hi, who's going to be watching this later. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> you missed the door prize. Yeah, you didn't think there would be a prize. No, just kidding. Just kidding. We're glad Debbie's watching this. So, before I start, though, let me pray before we get into God's Word. Father God, I give you... Praise and glory for this good day. I thank you especially for your word and for our free will. That there are things that we can know with certainty that you have in mind for our lives. But there are also times where, God, you give us the ability to choose what we will. And sometimes those decisions are hard. There's gray areas that we're not sure about. And God, I just ask that you help us discern in the gray areas. Help us to have the courage to follow your will and make the right choices when we know what's right and what's wrong. And God, be with us again. Give us wisdom so that we can make right choices for you. 
Now, God, I pray that you open our hearts and our minds and our souls this evening to the hearing of your word. May we never walk away from it unchanged or unaffected. And may we become more and more like you every day. It's in Jesus' name I ask all these things. Amen. Well, we got a lot of reading, and I'll start tonight just because there's a ton of it. But we're going to read 1 through um, 35 in Numbers 22. It says, Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, This horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor. Boy, there's a, this, these names are rough. So, <laughs> He was at Pethor, near the river, in his native land. Balak said, A people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people, because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the country. For I know that those you bless are blessed, and those you curse are cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for div divination. I'm saying it wrong. When they came from Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. <coughs> Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite princes stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these, those people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's princes, Go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite princes returned to Balak and said, to Balaam, said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent the other princes, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, This is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely. And do whatever you say. Come put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, Even if Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now stay here tonight as the others did, and I will find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road and into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. The angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards, with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it, so he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. 
The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared her. The lamb said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Go I with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of the land. I don't know about you guys, but if a donkey started talking to me, I think I'd have just fallen dead <laughs> right there. You know? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Does this story seem a little unreal to you? <laughs> Has an animal ever opened its mouth and started talking to you? Hey there, come on in. Why is Balak worried about Israel? If, and I, and I want to, I guess I probably need to preface chapter 22 with chapter 21 a little bit. You know, we have to get the whole context and the whole picture of what's going on. But the Israelites are getting ready to take the land that God has promised to them. They're getting ready to go into the homeland that God promised. And so they just came from defeating um, the land of the Amorites. They took over the Amorites' land. Israel had also conquered Og, king of Bashan, and took possession of his land. And word travels fast, doesn't it? You notice one of the things that Balak said first was they're so numerous. There's so many of them. They'll eat up the grass just like the oxen does. They'll lick it clean because they're so numerous. And I love that they noticed that. Because if you think back throughout the Old Testament up until this point, what was God promising the people of Israel? What did he promise them in the beginning when he cut covenant with them? Do you remember? To be as numerous as the stars. Yes. That his people would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And isn't that interesting that that's what the very thing that these kings of these nations were seeing. They're everywhere. There's tons of them. And they were afraid. So Balak's problem was he was scared, wasn't he? He was scared of what was going to become of him and his land. What role does divine help play in this ancient culture's problem solving? What do you think? I mean, what was his, Balak, what, what did he think was going to solve the problem for him in this issue? He sent his princes out. He sent his people out to go find Balak. And he sent with them what? Money. And what was the money for? What? To get him to go to, to put a curse on him. Yeah. It, it, it was for a fee. A dip, and I'm going to say, if I can say it right, I've tongue tied it all day today. A div, divin, uh, divination. It's a, thank you. It was a sorcerer's fee. Let's just be <laughs> It's an evil person's fee. I can't say the word. I've got tongue tied all day on it thinking about it. So they're taking this fee. So, what does that tell you about Balak? Think he's been known to be some type of sorcerer, some type of somebody that can cast down a curse? He'd accomplish what he wanted through his bribes. Yeah. 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 And so they thought, well, we'll send him a little money. He'll come back and he'll take care of this problem for us. He'll curse the people of Israel and problems will be solved. Now, what's interesting to me about this, and I don't know if it hits you, if they know anything about Israel, what should they know about Israel's God? How supernatural is he? I mean, he parted the Red Sea to get them out. Who does that? He fed them every day with manna from heaven. He followed them with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. Their clothes never wore out. There was miracles so numerous that they couldn't count. And it never occurred to them that some little curse that some little sorcerer might be able to put out there could take care of them. It never occurred to them how much mightier the God of Israel was, did it? 
And that just strikes me funny because I would think of all the things these kings should have heard about Israel. They should have heard how powerful Israel's God was. And I feel sure they did. So to me, their Balak's plea to get this little sorcerer to come and put a curse on them is just laughable. I mean, I just think it's laughable. I'm just thinking, he wasn't a very wise man, you know? I mean, surely, to goodness, he could come up with something a little bigger and better than that. But he did. What does it say about their belief in the super, supernatural? I mean... We must think? not have a very big belief if, if they feel like that the curse is more powerful. Yeah. It, I think it also th it shows, too, that even back then, they thought money could fix it, didn't they? We'll send this fee. We'll bring this guy back. Money's involved. Balak sends all, all the way to the Euphrates River Basin from Balaam twice. What does that tell you about Balak? He sends for him. I mean, it's way far off. It's quite a travel for him to send his princes and to send his money to go try to get him back. And he does it twice. The first time he's refused, so he sends them again. What does that say about him? He's persistent. He's persistent. He wants what he wants. He's scared. He wants what he wants. He's desperate. I mean, I'm thinking, wasn't there anybody there around him? I mean, you know, in this culture, there are sorcerers and, you know, pagan God worship everywhere. Why wasn't there somebody else just like Balak around? Why didn't he look from somebody from his own camp? Makes you wonder. tell you about the fact that Balak sins twice for Balaam. What does that tell you about Balaam? People have heard about him. Word gets around. He's all the way down in the Euphrates at the river basin. He's way far away, but they knew about him. This king knows about him. So he must have been popular. He must have some type of reputation that's gotten around. He's got a talking donkey. He's got a talking <laughs> donkey. He <laughs> told the circus that he didn't know he had. <laughs> Can you <buy> it too? <laughs> yeah. He's popular and his claim has just spread. What does Balak want Belong to do? Simple. What do the scriptures say you want him to do? Put a curse on him. Do you remember the scripture when God cut covenant? He said, I will bless those who what? Bless you. Bless you. And I will what? Curse curse you. Curse you. Yeah. Interesting, huh? How does this view, I'm sorry. Balaam denied the messengers the first time. That's what God said. God told him to. God told him to, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So he did what God said, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So why, if he had a sure word from God the very first time, does God or does Balaam go back and inquire of God a second time? He had a sure word. Hey there. He had a sure word the first time. God said no. The people come back to him the second time. He says, no, but, but let me go inquire of my God one more time and just see what he might have to say. Why do you think he did that? He had a little bit of an ego. They want me, you know. I might want to go, but let me, let me check. It's like a kid wanting somebody to spend the night with and mom saying no. Let me go ask again. Maybe I'll get <laughs> yeah. what I want. You know? Yeah, maybe. I'll just keep pestering him and he'll give in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, too, he wanted that money. Mm -hmm. I think he wanted to get some benefit out of this and 
so he thought, well, if God will finally say, God will finally give in, then I'll get this money they're bringing. But if I don't give in and go do this, I'm not going to get this money. What do you think? I think it had something to do with it. Why does God permit the lamb to go in the second time, but not the first? I mean, it's kind of interesting. Well, he tells him he can go, and then he gets mad. Yeah. And he went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, first time he tells him, no. The second time he tells him, go. And then he gets angry. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever? I mean, I think about my children all the time. And I think just what you said a minute ago, Carrie. When my kids pester me and pester me and pester me until they work, you know, they bend you down. You know, just like going to spend the night with a friend. And they wear you down. And you're just like, oh, my goodness. You know, and so you give in. But then you're mad because you let them go. Because you gave in. I've had that feeling. I wonder if that's kind of how God must have felt. I've had that feeling. The first thing that I don't want to do when my husband comes home off of a trip is make a decision. The first thing I want to say is, if the kids need anything, they need to ask you because I don't want to be asked again another question about can I do this, can I go here, can I blah, 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 blah. I, want, I don't want to answer it. I don't want to talk to them about it. No, ask me any questions. Ask your father. He's here now. <laughs> I, you know, those decisions are hard. But I totally get how hard, how angry God must have been because he wouldn't just accept the no the first time. Maybe he was kind of angry that he'd come back the second time in the first place. And so he was just like, okay, go to see what he'd do. Yeah. <laughs> see how you handle went, it. He was like, not exactly what I wanted you to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, he said he was going to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. He <laughs> said, I, yeah. Yeah. He said, I'm going to save this donkey. She's a pretty good donkey. But she yeah. was going to kill <laughs> yeah. So it may have just been a test to see what he'd do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes doesn't God just give us over to ourselves, don't you think? I think God sometimes, he works on our heart through the Holy Spirit. He convicts us of something, and we just keep pressing that nerve. Let me just keep pushing it to the limit, pushing it to the limit until he finally says, okay, have it your way. And he kind of steps back and let us have our, have our way. And what do we usually do? Get in a mess. Get in a mess and regret it, don't we? <laughs> we <laughs> wish we hadn't done it our way. We'll we justify it and think, well, you know, God, this is, he's saying this is, this is okay. Yeah. You know, because we tell ourselves that, or Satan does in disguise, and we believe it. Yeah. We can convince our th ourselves that anything is okay, can't we? With enough time and effort, we can put enough logic behind every decision we make to try to make it right, can't we? We can take the scripture out and twist it to fit our benefit as much as we want to to make it sound okay. And I wonder if that wasn't a little bit of what Balak was or Balaam was doing in his mind. If he wasn't just saying, well, I'll just go ask him again. You know, what can it hurt just to ask again? You know, I mean, can you just hear the reasoning and logic? I mean, they've sent all these princes, and they've sent them twice. This must be really important. And this is a king sending all these people. I mean, can you, can you just hear what must have been going through his head about why it was okay to go back to God and just ask him one more time? But even when God told him to go the first time, well, both yeah. times, he said, follow all these people that tell you. But then he got mad and told him that the donkey hadn't turned away, he'd have killed him. But then he says, go with them and give it. Only speak what I tell you. So I think you're right. I think he was probably just glad to say, yeah, go ahead. But then he thought about it, you know. Yeah. Do you think God gets frustrated? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if, you know, if we think about Jesus being a God man, and he experienced everything we did. Jesus got frustrated. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering in this moment if it wasn't just a frustrating moment for God. And I, I don't know the mind of God. And I can't begin to say that God has the same kind of emotion that I have. But part of me says, it's like Carrie said, one of those dealing with your, your, your wayward child moment, trying to get them to, to recognize right from wrong and just do it the first time. 
If I've said one time to my children, I've said it a hundred. I expect first time obedience. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's when you say, like I said before, I never repeat myself. <laughs> I expect first time obedience. Now that I've said that two times in a row. Absolutely. He's taking it all in. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? And, and I think God expected first time obedience. I don't need to repeat myself. It was very clear the first time. Does Balaam strike you as a captive agent loyal only to Yahweh or an independent agent brokering for any God and his highest bidder? What do you think? Captive agent or an independent agent? Based on what he did, I'd have to be independent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out for himself kind of person. Want God to bless him, but I'm going to do what I want to do. You bless me. He's the riding the fence kind of Christian. You know what I'm saying? When it benefits me, I am all in. And I am all about it. Because I want God's blessing, don't you? I want God's blessing. But then, there's that moment when, when it's not going my way and I don't like what you're saying, God. I don't like being told no. Or I don't like it that this isn't good for me. So then I get back over in my camp for a little while and have it my way. But if it's going to bless me, I'm going to get in this camp. Anybody been there? Do we have to say? <laughs> I've been there. I'll admit it. <laughs> what do you think God was trying to teach Balaam through this, through his loyal and spiritually alert donkey? I love this donkey. Balaam. First time obedience. Yeah, mm -hmm. I expect first time obedience. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to repeat myself. But we do. Yeah, <laughs> but we do. Yeah. But I don't want to have to. And you think you're so smart, but your donkey's smarter than you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He sees what you don't see. Or she, whoever the donkey is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think God succeeded in teaching Balaam a lesson? In this moment? You hope. You hope. Well, anybody that hears a donkey talk, they ought to learn something from that. <laughs> if God, you know, don't we, but we read this story. I don't know. Well, I read this story. Let me say it that way. I read this story and wish sometimes that God would speak to me that way. Sometimes when God's will is not clear to me, I wish he would write it in the sky. I wish he would send it in some format that I would know what to do. Send me a letter. <laughs> send me a letter, an email, a text message. Send me something, Lord, that makes it very clear. He probably speaks through your children. You just take it the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> now, my kids want me to think he's speaking through them. I'll be to try to convince me of that. <laughs> so, while we're, while we're on this topic, let's, let's talk about God's will for a minute. There is such a thing as God's sovereign will. Okay? God is sovereign. He is king. He is ruler. He is all-powerful. And what he decides to do will happen. It will come to pass. That is his sovereign will. When he said, let there be light, and there was light, that was his, him exercising his sovereign will. So there are things that we can, can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that is God's sovereign will for you and me. For instance, when he says, you know, do not commit adultery, that's what he sovereignly wants to happen in our life. Now, does he execute his sovereign will over us? Does he force us to do it? No. We had such a thing as permissive will. And what that means is he allows us freedom of choice. We have free will. And so we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt because God's word tells us that he does not want us to commit adultery. It's our full choice as to whether we do or we don't. Right? Does that make sense? So there are, there are things in life that we can know for certain because we have God's word. So if you're wondering what is God's will for me in my finances. It's very clear in here what God expects of us when it comes
comes to our finances. It might be, you might have to dig for it a little bit. It may not come out, you know, jumping off the page. But it's in here if you look for it. Now, you may be trying to make a decision today about what job am I going to take. I've got two job offers. Which one am I going to go to? Is the answer going to be in here? Clearly, no. It's a gray area. But I think there are some things that we can take away that would help us make a good decision. Here's some things I think about when I'm trying to make those kind of decisions. Number one, where am I at spiritually? Can I go, I've got two places to make a choice on. One of them happens to be a very Christian-oriented environment. There's a lot of Christians employed there. I've done a lot of research and I figured that out. And I know that. This is a good environment to work in. I've heard great things about the people that work there. The other environment, not so much. It's a secular environment. There's not any Christians there. Where am I spiritually? Am I spiritually sound enough that I feel like I can take the secular job and go in and make a difference? Or am I kind of weak? Am I new? Am I new Christian? Am I still trying to, to get more solid, so to speak? Not that we ever arrive, but can I handle being in that environment and staying Christ-like? Because if I can't, then maybe I need to go to this environment where there's more Christians around and maybe I, have, I can be more you know, I can become more like Christ because of that environment. That's just one of many ways, you know, pros and cons. Let's list them. You know, what kind of benefits does this place offer? But my first question is, where can I become more? Where can I show Christ more? And where can I become more like Christ more? Does that make sense? But I have to, I have to do a spiritual rating to say, where am I? Am I solid? Am I, am I okay? Can I handle this? And be honest with myself. There are gray areas, all kinds of gray areas in life that we're going to have where we're not going to be able to figure out God doesn't ride it in the sky. He doesn't send us a donkey to tell us. We have to make a decision. And we have to hope that God will bless it, that he will be with us in it. We have to pray about it. First and foremost, ask him. We have to read his word. Because sometimes, even though it's not really, really clear and defined, it's not written in the sky. There's answers in here. And through the work of his Holy Spirit, sometimes we'll be reading something and we'll go, oh my, there's my answer. Now, I've got my answer out of here. I've been praying about it. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ask somebody I really trust who's, who's godly that I look up to as a spiritual mentor. And I'm going to tell them how I'm feeling and what I'm thinking and see what they say. And see if they help me confirm what I'm feeling in my spirit is right in this situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There are ways to discern God's will when it's not crystal clear. And then sometimes, not that God doesn't care about all the choices we make. He does. But sometimes whether you wear a black shirt today or a white shirt today, really God is not big on his priority list. You know what I'm saying? God cares that you love him and you love others. God cares that you become most like him. So when you're in situations where it's gray, you can deduce, you can ask yourself some things. Am I loving him? Am I loving others? Am I becoming more like Christ by making these kind of situations, making these kind of choices? Does that make sense? Now, when it's not clear, and more times than not, it feels like it's not. You know, if you're raising kids right now, I'm going to tell you, I have come across more gray areas with my children and agonizing over what to let them do. How much of a rope do you give them? How much do you pull back? It's tough. It is tough. And sometimes we're on a wing and a prayer. You know what I'm saying? You just let, you just, you make the decision and you just pray to the good Lord that he blesses you. And, 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 and sometimes you have to say, you know what? I made a mistake and I'm so, so sorry. Hindsight's 2020. I see that now. Anybody ever made a big mistake? Ever? Yeah, <laughs> Praise God for forgiveness. 
And sometimes it's in the bad choices and the wrong mistakes that we grow. I mean, I think it's part of growing. But I think part of the growth is setting back and saying, before I make this choice, what would God's best choice be? What would his best choice be? I'm not going to settle for second. I'm going to, I want his best choice. What's his best choice? You know, it came out years ago. You probably remember them. They were the bracelets, and it was on T-shirts and, ev and everything, the WWJD. You remember that? You got it. What would Jesus do? And it kind of, you know, that mass market stuff, it kind of becomes a cliche after a while. And I don't like, I don't like that that happens because I think that's such an important way to help discern God's will when we're making choices. What would Jesus have done in this moment? What would he have done? And how are we going to know what he would have done? You got to know him. You got to know him. And how do you get to know him? Through his word. Through his word. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, those are the essence of Christ in those gospels. Those were his life, his ministry. That's where you get to know him. And through the whole Bible. No, don't mishear me. Christ is from the beginning to the end of it. But if you want a place to start, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And read them over and over and over and over. And think about, what did Christ do in that situation? Think about the big context of what was going on. And that will help. Well, I think, too, when you talk about, like, even something, well, it's not simple, but something like deciding about what job to take. We have to be careful a lot of times because it's not necessarily the best paying one where you should be. Yeah. But a lot of times that's the way we lean toward. Yeah. Oh, we can get more stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times that's not the right choice. Yeah, that's right. And a lot of prayer, a lot of, a lot of talking to somebody else you trust, a lot of getting us the word. And, and a lot of times the choices we make for Christ doesn't make a lot of sense. I'll tell you. Just some personal stories about what you're exactly what you're saying. I left a corporate job doing accounting next door at the Power Board to go into ministry, and I mean I'm not kidding you all. It was like a, a huge, gigantic—that's not even a word—ginormous <laughs> pay cut to do that without benefits. Didn't make sense. People would sit down and talk to you about it. Was like, what are you thinking? Every trip I ever went to, to India, all three times, well-meaning Christians would try to talk me out of it. Lori, you're a mom. Why would you leave your kids to go over to a place like that? You could be hurt. What are you thinking? Well-meaning people didn't get it. When we make decisions for Christ, when we ask ourselves in situations, what would Jesus do? And we follow his example to the rest of the world, and even well-meaning Christians, oftentimes it will not make sense to them and they won't get it. And oftentimes they won't even support you in it. But sometimes I think that, you know how you say you go to others, but if people are feeding those negatives, I think being Christian you say, well, maybe I should be doing this because it's going, you know, it's, like the devil trying to work through others yes. to make you not do yes. God's work. And it's okay. For his way. When, 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 when it says wise counsel, it doesn't mean you go to just one person. No. You don't always have to trust the first person you go to. And you, there's ways to look for God confirming things. There were ways when I went into ministry that God used other people to confirm his will for my life. There's a, there was a way for me to figure out, is this truly a calling, or is this just Lori? Well, usually when you go into any kind of ministry, it's not for a financial raise. It's for a spiritual <laughs> it was, raise. It's never for a financial yeah, raise. Yeah, it's no. a spiritual raise. Because <laughs> That's right. And I, I've been on so many mission trips, and I was telling my wife that it seems like almost every one of them, like a week or two before you know, you're going to go, something always jumped in there trying to get you not to go. Yeah. Yeah. Either somebody saying, well, you surely shouldn't leave this behind, you know. Yeah. And uh, there was always something there. It was always like a little test like, to see how, you, have to you know, follow through. Yeah, to follow through. You know, sometimes what helps me, when, I, when I've come to 
to a decision in my mind, and I know it's what Christ wants for me. There's this, there's this passion, this yearning, this, you know, it's going to hurt me not to do it. You know what I'm saying? When I really know God's in it and God's for it, it's, it almost makes you physically ill not to do it. But that's part of growing in Christ. You know, it takes, it takes time. I, I wasn't always that way. So it's part of the journey. And the more you become more like him, I think the more that pull, you know, the Holy Spirit is more, you're filled more with him. He's more a part of your day-to-day -day life. You know what I'm saying? And it's a healthy fear. Yeah. Uh, just like me coming to work here at the time that I was off, it was a part-time job. Mm -hmm. I was working a full-time job. We were not making it. I mean, you know, we were losing businesses. We had our house for set. We were just not making it. Yeah. So it made zero sense See. to t leave a full-time job and take a part-time job making less money. Mm -hmm. But we really felt like God was calling us to do that. So even to us, it didn't make sense. Yeah. It's not until years later, you know, that hindsight thing, you, you can look back. But the, the fear of making that step of faith versus the fear of being disobedient was you know, that was our, that's what we looked at yeah. there. And I, we want to be obedient. That's right. First time obedience. And you know, I have to say, and I know Carrie would testify this too, even though the money will never stack up, the reward because of that obedience, because of making that hard choice and making the sacrifices, I mean, I won't lie to you, it, it, is, it was a sacrificial obedience in more ways than I could say. And it wasn't always pretty. It, it, it hadn't always been easy. But with all that being said, no matter how much sacrifice there was on my part and my family's part for that decision, the reward has far outweighed any material blessing that God could have ever given us. And we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't change it for a million years. And that's the thing, you know, I think when we think about God's will and whether we're following it or not, we start thinking, well, if I follow it, there's going to be this blessing. And, and there's, there's a group out there that would say, you know, one of the things I saw, and this just explains it. I saw a, a church sign a couple of weeks ago in Johnson City, and it said, if you're, if you're short on money, this is what it said, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is what it said. If you're short on money, tithe. Did you see that? Did you see that? And that raised every hair on the back of my neck. Yes. I'm like, because that is not true. I can be a faithful tither, and that does not mean that God is going to make my bank account bigger. It doesn't mean he won't, but it doesn't mean he will either. And that's not the reason you tithe. That's not the reason we tithe either. God says so. There are a lot of people that believe in the prosperity gospel. Yeah. You know, that if you, <coughs> the more you give, the more you're going to get back, and that our reward is here on earth. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that our reward is here on earth. I mean, the Bible says that, you know, lay up your treasures in heaven where, you know, Long the rest can't destroy. Rest can't destroy. Yeah. yeah. But that prosperity, you see, we're not, we don't get always God's kind of blessing. God gives us blessing, I believe, here on earth. Yeah, but, but not there necessarily is monetary. Not monetary. Well, yeah. Yeah. And we have prosperity is money. Yes. Right. right. We our have to be our spiritual. Yeah. God's blessing is a different kind of blessing than a prosperity gospel will ever preach. But he also, God also says he, he will supply our needs. He will. He will. Not I think he does. Wants necessarily. Right. <laughs> a lot of times you think, we well, we you know, he didn't answer my prayers, but not answering your prayers may have been the best thing, you know. Sometimes it's, I ate today. He answered it, just not the way we exactly. wanted it. Yeah. 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 But he answers yeah. them. When I was in, I don't, I don't know, if it, I think it was primary Sunday school class. And my teacher at the time, I'll never forget this, she said, she was teaching about tithing. And she said, I, my family and I have always had a very hard time. And I've always tithed. And she said, what that has brought to me is that I've always had food on it. Our family has always had food on the table. Yeah. And not that she ever, not that she was punishing a lot. She always had food on the table for her family. Yeah. And 
I will always remember that thought that the comment there. Yeah. I mean, you know, we were middle, we were primary. I'm pretty sure we were primaries. Now that's little. Yeah. Yeah. But that's always stuck with me. Tithing is is so important. Amen. Uh, and I know, I know. For one, tithing is is a way that we give back. I mean, you know, God is yeah. rich. So it's a, it's a heart issue. You know what I'm saying? And, and in my opinion, it, a New Testament kind of tithing is a whole lot different. If you read Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Offer yourselves. Mm -hmm. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's not 10%. You give me everything. Mm -hmm. And I think he gives it back to you in health. Yes. In, in your mind to do things, in your actions to do things. I know we're not saved by works, but. Uh, he allows us to make money, yeah. uh, you know, to give to him. That's right. And, I mean, we could, yeah, you're right. We could not be physically able to work. He gives us the ability to work. He gives us the ability to earn money. You know, the Bible says everything is the Lord's. Mm -hmm. We're just his managers. We're just his stewards. We steward our bodies. We steward our stuff. We steward our money. We're just managers of it. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Which is the greater miracle? God opening Balaam's eyes or the donkey's mouth? Which one would you say? No right or wrong answer. What do you think? Both. Oh. <laughs> Balaam's eyes because it also opens his heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's hard for God to get our attention in it. You know, sometimes he has to go to great lengths. So I've said before, sometimes if we're not willing to bend the knee, he'll break the leg. Um, <laughs> ever, God ever broke your legs to get your attention? Metaphorically? You know? Which are you more like? Balaam or his donkey? being an animal could already see it you know yeah. I, I think that's interesting that you know the man Balaam he had to have his eyes opened by God but the donkey could already see it I think that's an interesting I thing. will say we ride horses and our horses they are so in tune to nature and things around them I mean honestly we can be riding and we see nothing coming and all of a sudden, you can feel it when you're riding that horse. Body will perk up, his ears go straight up, you know, and, and they're alert. And as soon as my horse's ears go whoop, like forward like that, I know something's a muck, something's a muck. There's a deer, there's a rabbit, there's a squirrel, there's a car coming. There is something around that they sense. They have a neat sense about them. And I can feel it in my horse's whole body to let me know. Well, but our, you know, our minds are different than an animal's mind. They don't have not been equipped with, you know, knowledge and right. all the things that around the world that they're affecting them. It's nature and what God has put in front, you know. Right. right. But thinking about that horse or that donkey, because right. donkeys the same way. They're just they are so in tune to their surroundings. Mm -hmm. Don't you think for you and I? this day and time where we have the gift of the Holy Spirit that if we so choose to follow Christ and allow him to work in our hearts and lives and ask for that filling in the spirit that we could not that we could be so in tune to the spiritual things of God to where we're just like that horse you know what something's starting to go amok and our spiritual radar just comes on you ever have a gut feeling about somebody? You ever have a red flag go up? It says, uh, uh, uh. I better not do that. I better not say that. I better not take that from that person. Something about that doesn't feel right. I think we can have that spiritual sense.
sense too. And, and what I will say to you, when you get to these gray areas of trying to make decisions, the more in tune you are to Christ and his spirit, the easier that decision making can become. Not always. Because sometimes Christ wants us to wrestle down some. You know, he, he wants us to wrestle it down and make a wise decision. But I think more times than not, in those gray areas, that's when we just want the work of the Spirit in our lives. You know, so desperately, I know I do. I want to know that I'm on God's side and I'm, I'm doing the best, yes, I'm doing the best decision I can do for Him because I want His best in my life. Have you ever found yourself opposing God? kind of been like Balak or Balaam. Sorry, I'm getting my babies confused. You ever, you ever feel like Balaam where you just you kind of want to keep questioning? Do you really want me to do this? Are you sure? I've had it where, you know, you said you sometimes you get that gut feeling that something that you're you're not doing the right thing. You know, if you've made had two decisions you could make and you've made one and you just have this gut feeling that that was the wrong one, but you keep doing it anyway because you think that one's better. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've been in that situation and God has put a roadblock and, you know, whatever I had planned to do, you know, it's, I, I'm stopped in my tracks and I can't do it, so I have to go back and do the other thing. I'm like, you know, if I would have just paid attention to that feeling that I had, you know, that this was not the right thing, then maybe I could have avoided some of the, the problems. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, just like with my kid, there's kids, I say there's always a consequence for your choices. There's either good consequences or there's bad consequences. When it comes to following Christ, there's consequences when we blatantly oppose God's word and his will. He says he disciplines his children. He does. And you know what? I think part of the discipline is we just have to deal with our mess. <laughs> you know, you ever got yourself in a mess? Made a bad decision and you just found yourself down in a deep, dark hole? And then you, it's left to you to figure out, how am I going to climb back up out of this? How am I going to fix this? When if we'd have just done what we knew was right to start with, would we not have saved ourselves and others? Because I'm telling you, there's a wake in our choices. We leave a wake behind. David Clark always has described it in his sermons about that wake that's behind that boat. And that water goes out and it ripples out to everybody. Mm -hmm. It ripples out to the people that love us, the people we work with. You know, our choices affect other people, whether we like it or not. It leaves a wake. Yeah, I had made a decision to um, make a, t take a job for a lot more money. And this is the decision I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, and, Good thing uh, you rode a donkey to work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I had already, you know, I quit my job and I was going to do this, this job where I was going to make a ton of money and I was all excited about it. But I, like I said, I had that feeling that I was doing something that wasn't right. And I kept thinking, well, why? This is, I don't see why this isn't right. And, uh, you know, there was a roadblock put in my way and I couldn't do that. And so I had to go back to, you know, my job that I have now. You know, if I had done that, we would have never got married. I would have never, we would have never been foster Aww. parents. We would, you know. It, there would have been so many things that were different because it was a traveling job and I wouldn't have even been here. So it's, you know, you look back on things and you think, well, God knew all along and was trying to tell me that that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing with my life. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't supposed to be following money. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, makes, it makes you wonder when your situation, God put a roadblock up just like he did yeah. for Balaam. Right. He put a roadblock in his way through the donkey and he stopped stopped him. And I got really mad at it, too. Like, he beat the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd have to stick out beating the donkey. Oh, no, no. If it would have been the donkey, I would have been beating it. <laughs> Bless her heart. Because <laughs> I was really mad. <laughs> but how many, how many decisions in our life do you think we've made? Like, you're explaining, if I hadn't had that roadblock and went back, then look at all these wonderful things in my life that I'm blessed with now right. because I made the right decision. Eventually. <laughs> but what if I had went on with it? How many times do you think we've made a poor decision, we've went on with it, and we've missed out 
We just completely missed out on God's best for our lives. We won't know this side of heaven, but don't you wonder sometimes if when we get to heaven there won't be this movie reel? And God would say, this is what your life could have been like. I don't think you'd ever be that cruel to us. Oh, but this is what it could have been like had you have just followed what I asked you to. First time obedience. You just done it the first time. This is what it could have been like. Yeah, I think sometimes, too, if we're so, if we're so uh, committed to doing something that's not really what he wants you to do, he gives us a shovel. He says, dig. Dig yourself in a hole. And then or you, reach, you can use the shovel to get yourself back. And then out. reach back, reach out to him, and you know. And and you know, it, it's so hard. And you all know, as parents, <laughs> if you're a parent, and you guys are going to get to figure this out, you so want your kids to make the right choice because we're wise enough. We've seen, we've lived enough that we know. You know, it's we like, know nothing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of you know nothing. I have teenagers. I don't know. <laughs> because that's a part of the growing process. It is. And and I think that's I think that's the way it is with us with God. Yeah. You know, he, he can see this yes. is not best for you, but I love you enough to let you do it your way and Until then you'll you see, figure it out. <laughs> that's that free will. Yeah. That's how much he loves us that he gives us that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've ever thought of free will being a gift of his love. But it truly is. <laughs> it truly is. Do you think it's possible to always know God's will every step of the way? Be nice. Be nice. <laughs> Be awesome. Yeah. Not always. Where do you identify with the lawn the most? And I'm going to read some things and tell me where you fall. Ignoring God and going ahead. Kidding myself about my motives. Experiencing adversity as a way God gets my attention. Recognizing the holiness of God the hard way. Being willing to turn back when God says so. Where do you find yourself? I mean, we can all learn from this situation. I mean, thank goodness for the long that God sent this donkey and he sent these angels and he put roadblocks in his path. And I think... A lot of times God tries to do that with us, you know. He sees us going down a wrong path, and he tries to put roadblocks up, he, you know, or he puts people in our midst to try to help us. And sometimes we see them, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we see them, and we ignore them. You know? When the direction of your life undergoes a mid-course correction, like we were talking about over here, how do you generally <laughs> respond? You get mad at God? <laughs> what do you do, Kimberly? What about do you get defensive? When somebody comes to you and they see that you're about to make a wrong turn? Do you get defensive? Yeah, because I know better. Because you know better. I'm always right. Yeah, yeah. Do you lash out at others? Do you take do you take it out on somebody else? Because you're not getting your way. What about beating up on yourself? Just beat yourself down a little bit. What about just ask for forgiveness? <clears throat> Maybe. How do you go about making important decisions in your life? Prayer. Prayer. Okay. Pray about them. Primary. Pardon? That's my primary. Start with prayer. What else? Sleep on it. Sleep on it. Sometimes get it rest. 
yeah. them we want to make today. So. Yeah. Let's not rush. Mm -hmm. If it's an important decision, let's not rush to make it. Let's give ourselves some time to mull it over. Yeah. What else? Um, What's some other good advice we can give one another about making decisions? Talk to somebody that you know that you know they believe you that you trust like a mentor or something. Yeah. Get some advice, mm -hmm. some godly counsel. And, and get more than one. In practice patience. Yeah, be patient, don't rush. Yeah. I like to do research. Research. Yeah. yeah. Learn mm -hmm. everything you can, even in this job market today. You know, when I'm working with people in ministry and they're looking for new jobs, I am like an advocate for do your homework. They're going to research you as an employee. You research, you research them. Learn everything you can about them. You might find out something that you just don't want to. Yeah, yeah. Even with a company, a even with a, a workplace. What's the work environment around here? How do your employees get along? What do you do when people are sick? What happens when my kids are sick and the, and the school calls? How do you handle things like that? It's okay to ask good questions and do your research. I always felt like an interview is not a one-way thing. It's a two-way. Exactly. It has to be a two-way thing. Yeah. They don't do a lot of interviews anymore, yeah. though. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is falling in there. You fill the online and they call you and they say, okay, come in and work. They don't even want to see you face-to-face. That's sad. Climate's changing. Yeah. So we can do our research. We can pray. We can get godly advice. What else? Read the Bible. Uh -oh. <laughs> Listen. Here's, here's your sign. Yeah, here's your sign. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's 8 o'clock, so I'm going to stop there. I hope that, you know, I want you to know that it might, the choices we make, no matter how small or how great, are so important to God. He wants us to make decisions and make our choices based on what his best for our life will be. You know, not what we want, but his best. And you know, we often think, what I think happens, and I'll close with this, is that often we think that maybe God doesn't have our best interests at heart because it seems harsh. It seems harsh to have to follow Ten Commandments. It seems harsh to have rules. You know what I'm saying? To, to live by sometimes. And it feels like, you know, I've heard people say they don't want to give up their life to become a Christian because you have to be so goody-goody. You have to follow all these rules. You have to do all this stuff. But if we truly believe that God is good, his essence is love. His essence is goodness and kindness. If we truly believe that, then every decision we make that is Christ-like is good for us. It protects us. It keeps us safe. It gives us peace. It's not to take something away from our lives. It's to give something to us. And I think... So many times when we think about making choices and making decisions, we just think that we're going to have to give up so much and it's going to be miserable. You're going to gain so much more. It's going to be miserable. From the law. Yeah. Like that loss that you think you're going to lose, you're going to gain something more yeah. from him in, in your life. We had a, and I'll end on this story because I know it's time. We had a, a fellow that got um, accepted Christ here. He went on a, a ski trip one time with our Sunday school class. And I'll never forget this. My husband spent the whole weekend, he'd never been skiing, my husband spent the whole weekend teaching him to ski, the, the, the whole class kind of, you know, welcomed him in. We got back, he went, and I think talked to Dave Clark about becoming a Christian. He said, you know what? And this stuck with me. He said, I thought you, you had to give up so much. He said, I didn't know you could have fun without having alcohol. Mm -hmm. He said, that group of people had the best time. And it was good, clean fun. They didn't have to have any of that stuff. And I had the best time. But I didn't know you could do that without having that. And, you know, it, that stuck with me because I think that's what happens in our choices sometimes. And I'm not making it about alcohol or anything else, but, what, but if you get the point of it is sometimes we think that we're going to have
have to give up so much to do God's will. And it's not always like that. Yeah, it's denial sometimes, it's sacrifice, but it's to receive his best. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Let me pray and then you be dismissed. Father God, we give you praise and glory for this good day, another day to live and move and breathe <laughs> and be your child. Now, God, I pray that you be with us as we leave here today. I pray that you take this last six weeks of study together and that you help us to become more like you. That's the ultimate goal, Lord. Because when we center our lives in becoming more like you, everything else takes care of itself. God, I love you and I thank you for your son. I thank you for your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We've been in here. If you don't have a small group, you're welcome to join us. Start next week. Yeah, next week. 6.30. In here.